Andy Capistano joins us. So, mate, we've had the All Blacks on their official Twitter page thank All Black fans for the continued support this year. Nice kind of gesture. And I understand that you've actually had something similar happen over the year, have you? Yes, Rassi actually went uh, online to thank everybody for turning out. Uh, we had something like a 97.5% take-up for tickets um, for the uh, test matches this year, um, which is incredible when you go back before COVID, when people were starting to worry that ticket prices were going up, um, corporates weren't uh, taking up their tickets to the extent that they used to. But with two years not being allowed to watch live sport, suddenly the uh, the crowds are back, and that's great to see. How do you assess your performance in the rugby championship then? Coming second, I mean, points differential and so forth. Put all that aside, though, just in terms of how well you played, your best game, where you're at currently, all that stuff. Yeah, uh, well, best game, obviously, being the All Blacks in Nell um, that was uh, That was the high um, watermark of uh, performances this year. Um, low watermark was probably the following week, although you could argue that it was uh, losing to Australia, um, that anybody who loses to Australia doesn't uh, um, deserve to win the championship this year. But I think, you know, we've spoken about it before. This is probably the most even championship uh, since it began. And uh, it's great to see that uh, everybody can beat everybody else. Uh, Who would have thought at the start of the season that... um, uh, that Argentina would win a test match in, in New Zealand. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. And uh, and they brought uh, a great game to Kings Park on, on Saturday as well. You know, this all this nonsense talk of, well, all the Springboks have got to do is win by 40 clear points. Uh, that was never going to happen against uh, a proud Argentine side. I, I'm really pleased uh, the way that they played. Um, so I think you can probably say at the end of the Springbok season here uh, that they're a work in progress. They're, they're not the team that won the World Cup in 2019, um, <clears throat> but they've got some, some really great new talent coming in and they will bring a lot more in uh, in the Tour of Europe at the end of the year when not only are they playing four test matches, but they're sending an SAA team to play uh, two midweek games as well. So there's going to be probably the best part of 50 South African players on tour in Europe. And that will certainly give everybody um, food for thought for the World Cup year next next year. Andy Capistano, broadcaster for us out of South Africa. Fascinating you say that. We've got our two All Black 15 matches as well. I mean, we used to actually just send a team on tour and you'd have midweek, you know, you have the dirty dirties and so forth. But now, of course, they all come with different names because I suppose they've all got to be commercially sold and everything else. And I also find it fascinating (laughs) that um, you say that you thought it was a really interesting rugby championship. It was competitive, it was contestable, and it was also very even. See, we can't even get our heads around that here in New Zealand. I'm sitting there thinking that I'm giving the All Blacks a B- minus for our season. Five wins, four losses, and a couple of those losses were oh, terrible. I mean, the history, making losses for the wrong reasons and things. But we really struggle in this country to actually look at that bigger picture like you do. Like, you actually look at this as something that um, th- these, this is a bunch of matches. We played them. We now build upon that. We look forward to the end of the year, and we look forward to next year. We're still in this hole where if we don't win every single match and belt an opponent by 30 points, it just seems that the country just goes just completely sideways. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Um, and, and people are already saying that the master plan um, is is working perfectly. We've managed to keep Ian Foster in his job. <laughs> ah, yeah, it's a running gag that, isn't it? Eh? So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. You're looking at the All Blacks. Where do you think that we're sitting at the moment? Well, I I don't think there's any question. You're the best team in the world on any given day. The difference is that you're not the team that was winning 15, 16, 17, 18 games in a row as you were under under Richie McCaw with Dan Carter at fly half. You're not that quality of team, um, but... There is absolutely no question that if if the cards fall any anywhere on the day, the All Blacks are still going to uh, put thirty or forty points on you if you don't play properly. Um, and and that it speaks about the depth of talent that you have. Now I was lucky enough to um, commentate on Saturday on your um, under nineteen team. They played against the Sharks under nineteens at uh, Durban High School, uh, and I saw the next generation coming through and and i have to say that as usual it's awesome 
um, fantastic blend of power and pace. And what really impressed me about the side, uh, by the way, they had a fly half by the name of Byron Smith. Keep a, keep an eye out for him. He's going to be your next great one. Um, what really impressed me about the under 19s was their simple ability to play set piece rugby and get the ball quickly to the win- wings and score in the corner. Um, the, doing the, the basics well is what all black rugby and New Zealand rugby is all about. You've got nothing to worry about. Yeah, you must just get over this, uh, this problem of having to win every game. What about Australia then, Andy? I was reading in the Daily Telegraph yesterday that the call's already out to sack Dave Rennie. It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, you know, just a week or so ago or more in Melbourne, he was a Bernard Foley brain fade away from getting one hand on the Bledisloe low cup. And I think that that, <laughs> that single win would have probably cemented him in his job until next year. Now, of course, you know, they get 40 points put on the Eden Park and, and the press are calling for him. Yeah, well, that's what the press do, isn't it? And um, and I'm a member of the press, and and uh, I will stick up for our um, uh, our reason for doing that um, because it sells newspapers, it uh, gets clicks online. Um, but you know, anybody who's in charge of the Australian Rugby Union team has got a poison chalice because you've got so few people to call uh, uh, an international side from. Um, all your best talent goes to rugby league. Uh, or to Aussie rules or overseas, and you have to try and mix and match every year. Um, and 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 my feeling is that Dave Rennie's doing as as good a job as as he's allowed to do. Um, and and again, um, you look at the their best performances, and you say, well, that's that's a decent rugby team. Um, and you look at their worst performances, and you say, well, my God, how did they manage to plumb those depths? Um, so all they've got to do, I think, is raise their game by sort of 15%, and they'll be fine. Andy Capistano, out of South Africa for us. All right, the Northern Hemisphere, what are they gleaning from what they've seen, do you think, in the rugby championship? I, well, the most important thing is, is that they don't need to be scared. Um, the, I, I think the key results so far this year were, were Ireland coming to you and winning a series. Um, and it's as simple as that. Um, when, when things, when the going gets tough in the World Cup next year, uh, they will simply look at that um, moment and say, right, we can compete. And it's not just Ireland um, who will be looking at that. It's France, it's England. Um, and, and don't rule out the likes of Scotland and Wales, um, who've got lots of talent. Um, that, and, of course, importantly, this World Cup is going to be in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and, and just as I've talked about this rugby championship being uh, the, the most even ever, I think we're, we're heading for the most even World Cup ever. And, and so, so many things contribute to that. But one of the important things is, is that uh, what do New Zealand... Australia and South Africa export. They export rugby players. They all go and play in the Northern Hemisphere. They're not scared of us anymore. Okay, yeah, let's. Yeah, yeah. I think you're exactly right, as a matter of fact. And I'm looking at it thinking, I wonder whether what the rugby that they have seen, they're scared of either. You know, do we play a style down here that is not conducive to winning World Cups, especially in New Zealand here, where we've got this idea that we've got to score 10 tries every game and Super Rugby's probably indoctrinated our players in that. When it comes to Test Rugby, Ireland played really simple rugby, didn't they? Very effective rugby. That's what we're going to see from those teams up there. Should we be afraid of them? I think the only the only uh, time you start worrying is is if the cyclone comes in and it becomes uh, a 10-man game where you can't score. Um, half a dozen tries a game. Um, uh, but on, on any surface where um, you can get the ball to the wings or if you've got a good crash ball centre that everybody else can play off, um, the All Blacks don't have a problem. Um, you, you, you really must get over this idea that um, just because you lost a few games this year, you're rubbish. You're not rubbish. Um, you're not what you were but you'll get back there very quickly indeed. Everybody knows that. And and what do you do when you see an all-black player down? You kick him because you know he's not going to be down for long. See, this is music to our ears here. We've just been in such a fuck, Andy. We really have. We've just been down on ourselves like you wouldn't believe. It's just tearing us apart <laughs> is what it is. Do you know, I, I remember Ian Smith, um, the, uh, the cricket commentator, Wonderful, talking about... Um, the All Blacks coming back from the 2015 World Cup and seeking psychiatric help. And I think he said something along the lines of the poor dears. 
In the end, though, is is what you've seen is was it good roaring rugby? Is it what the sport needed that that rugby championship? Because I mean, this is the one thing we forget when we get embroiled in the results, isn't it? It's still meant to be one of the best competitions in the world. It's still meant to be something that the neutral looks at and goes, "Wow, this is the sport played to its highest level." Is it delivering that? It, uh, no, it's not, and uh, and I'll tell you exactly why. The standard of officiating in this rugby championships was the worst that I can ever remember. In every single game, there was a howler, whether it was from the referee or from the TMO or from the assistant referees. Something went stupidly wrong where a non-rugby union person would look at that and say, well, I'm not going to support that sport. That's just stupid. Um, and, And we've seen it in every single game and i think if there is a crisis in world rugby it is that we've got to find some decent referees who can interpret the laws in a way that people who pay their money at the turnstiles want to watch the game